Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss convergent evolution between placental and marsupial mammals. So let's jump right in. <laughs> We're taking a huge step backwards in time from 90 to 160 million years ago, dropping us off in the Oxfordian epoch of the late Jurassic period. In the last video, we mostly skipped over a big debate in mammal evolutionary history. When did placental mammals evolve? Although there are many varying options in between, generally speaking, there are three main hypotheses. Short fuse, long fuse, and explosive model. The short fuse model posits that the common ancestor of placental mammals and the various placental mammal orders arose in the Cretaceous. This is the view typically argued by geneticists. Further, placental mammal diversity began increasing before the KPG extinction. Second, the long fuse posits that the common ancestor of placental mammals lived in the Cretaceous, but most orders appeared around, mostly slightly after, the KPG extinction. However, placental mammals persisted at low diversity until the KPG extinction wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs, allowing the mammals to radiate. Third, the explosive model argues that the common ancestor of placental mammals and the orders arose during the Paleocene. This view has been advanced by paleontologists. So what hypothesis does the data currently favor? Well, the explosive model can be rejected almost immediately because the mutation rate necessary for all placental orders to split post-KPG is commensurate with that of double-stranded DNA viruses. Additionally, the early fossil record of placental mammals is highly incomplete due to most placentals being small insectivores with delicate bones, precisely the features that would make preservation difficult. Phylogenies based on large gene sets appear to favor the long fuse model or slight modifications on it. Essentially, most placental orders diverged before the KPG boundary, except maybe the Xenarthran orders, but most crown members originated afterwards. The late Cretaceous radiation of placentals may have been caused by a diversification of angiosperms. Branching out a bit, Placentalia is a subset of the larger clade Eutheria, which in addition to placentals, also includes everything more closely related to placentals than any other extant taxon. The oldest eutherians in the fossil record come from the late Jurassic Chinese Chaozhishen formation, dated to 160 million years ago. That mammal is known as Jeremiah. It has been diagnosed as a eutherian based on its teeth, which exhibit an identical formula to the early Cretaceous eutherian Eomaya, also from China. Thus, even though Dawkins and Wong used Jeremiah to date the split between placentals and marsupials, in reality, the split would have occurred probably at least a few million years prior to that. One estimate puts that split about 178 million years ago. We'll discuss using fossils in molecular clocks when we come to the velvet worm's tail, so stay tuned. Evidently, there was a radiation of mammals in the late Jurassic, since that's when eutheria and metatheria, marsupials and their extinct kin, appeared as well as the now completely extinct Dryolestida, Spelacca thyroidea, and Eutrachonodonta. An early to middle Jurassic radiation resulted in Multituberculata, Prototheria, and Docodonta, but we'll talk about all these extinct groups next time. Mammal evolution went through multiple adaptive radiations, however the majority of these groups have since gone extinct. With the few exceptions of the monotremes, the only living mammals are the Metatherians, which includes only marsupials today, and eutherians, of which only placentals survive today. Together, the metatherians and eutherians are called therians. The mammaliform dominated fauna of the early to middle Jurassic gave way to therian dominated fauna in the late Jurassic and into the Cretaceous. Those early therians appear to have been almost entirely insectivorous, or at least insectivore leaning omnivores. Interestingly, recent fossil finds have shown that the ecological diversity of Metatheria in the late Cretaceous was actually much greater than previously realized. They were omnivores, frugivores, carnivores, and even durophagous Metatherians. 
So what are the differences between placental and marsupial mammals? The major difference everyone is familiar with is the pouch for holding juveniles that most marsupials have. The pouch is called the marsupium. Marsupial juveniles are often born relatively underdeveloped, so they must climb up and attach to the mother's teeth. As a result, when marsupials are born, their heads and forelimbs are comparatively well developed to allow them to scale the mother. Intriguingly, this specialized reproductive strategy has largely constrained marsupial evolution even though they have substantial ecomorphological diversity. This adaptation is clearly a result of historical contingency. Early therian mammals had short gestation times, so both marsupials and placental mammals adapted to this challenge in different ways. Marsupials adapted by developing certain body parts faster than others to climb the mother, while placental mammals greatly elongated their gestation times. Of course, physiology and ontogeny are very difficult to tell from the fossil record, so what do the fossils tell us about the metatherian eutherian split? Well, the major differences between the early small insectivorous metatherians and the early small insectivorous eutherians are the relative shapes of their teeth. I know we say this a lot on this channel, but it bears repeating. As you approach the common ancestor between two clades, members of both lineages become increasingly similar morphologically and genetically. This is a specific prediction of evolution, and we can see here that the morphological side has been fulfilled yet again. What a shock. The earliest metatherian is possibly Sinodelphus from the early Cretaceous of China, 125 million years ago. However, a paper in the journal Nature by Shundong et al. from 2018 argued that Sinodelphus is a eutherian instead of a metatherian. But again, when going this far back in time, the difference between eutherians and metatherians are very subtle, so such ambiguities are to be expected. Early metatherians are known from Central Asia, and they later spread outwards from there, with some ending up in North America, such as Holoclemencia from 110 million years ago. Most metatherian evolution took place in North America, even though a few migrated back into Asia, such as Delta Theridium. Within metatheria is the clade Marsupialiformes, which splits into two clades, Sparacidonta and the group including crown marsupials. The former, Sparacidonta, is an order of carnivorous metatherians that independently migrated to South America sometime in the late Cretaceous, but interestingly, no Sparacidonts seem to have continued migrating southward to Antarctica, which was a balmy forest at the time. The fossil record of Sparacidonts begins in the earliest Paleocene with small omnivorous and carnivorous forms like Meulestes. Starting in the Middle Eocene, Sparacidonts started evolving larger sizes such as the hypercarnivores Boar hyena and Australo hyena, culminating in the Thylaca smilus. Although Thylaca smilus has often been likened as highly convergent with saber-toothed cats, there are some very notable differences. In a paper from 2020, Janice et al. argue that Thylaca smilus couldn't have occupied an ecological niche similar to cats. Instead, it was predominantly a scavenger and specialized in feeding on internal organs. Why these sparacidonts went extinct is currently unknown. Researchers previously thought that competition with placental mammals following the formation of the Panamanian Isthmus drove them to extinction. However, almost all sparacidonts were already extinct by the time the Great Biotic Interchange started. On the other hand, the clade encompassing modern marsupials and their close extinct relatives originated either in Asia or North America about a hundred million years ago in the late Cretaceous. Outside of crown marsupialia is a variety of weasel to badger-sized metatherians, such as the carnivorous or duraphagus didelphodon, which was featured in the BBC documentary Walking with Dinosaurs. Marsupialiform diversity appears to have declined from about 79 million years ago to the end Cretaceous extinction event, with only sparacidonts and crown marsupials surviving into the Cenozoic. Early crown marsupials include the paradectes mimoparadectes complex that extended from the earliest Paleocene to the early Oligocene. And of course, we have to bring this discussion back to plate tectonics. From the formation of Gondwana about 550 million years ago until around 120 million years ago, South America, Africa, Antarctica, and Australia were all connected. Then, South America and Africa split first, with Antarctica gradually pulling farther south. Then between 40 to 30 million years ago in the Eocene or early Oligocene, Australia finally broke off from Antarctica. So how did these tectonic changes affect the evolution of marsupials? Crown marsupials likely originated in South America as that's where the three clades, Didelphomorphia, Placituberculata, and Microbiotheria still live, 
which are paraphyletic to the remaining marsupials. All the marsupials from Australia, New Guinea, and Tasmania are collectively known as Australadelphia. Before we get to the more famous Australian fauna though, let's meet the New World opossums. Didelphomorphia includes semi-arboreal omnivores with prehensile tails, such as the grey short-tailed opossum and the bare-tailed woolly opossum. My audience is probably familiar with the Virginia opossum, the one marsupial currently native to North America. The ancestors of this species migrated to North America following the Great American Biotic Interchange around 3 million years ago. Next, Posset tuberculata is the shrew opossums with only seven living species. These are mostly small, nocturnal insectivores. Lastly in the Americas is Microbiotheria containing a single living species, the Manito del Monte. This too is a small insectivore with a partially prehensile tail. Now we come to the question of how marsupials traveled all the way from South America to Australia. Unlike with the ancestors of platyrines, lemurs, and xenarthrans, no rafting seems to have been involved. Instead, marsupials simply walked from one connected landmass to another. Researchers wondered for a long time whether marsupials crossed Africa or Antarctica on their way to Australia, and the first Antarctic metatherian fossils turned up in the 1980s. In the 1990s, fossil microbiotherians were discovered in Antarctica along with various other now-extinct metatherians, such as Pujatodon. Along with them have been found latopterns, such as Nodiolophos, Astrapotheres, such as Antarctodon, at least one indeterminate Xenarthron, an herbivorous ratite, some falconids, and even a forest rachid. The fossil record of Antarctica is, due to its climate, extremely poor. However, the fact that it was tropical for millions of years before splitting away is well established. Presently, Microbiotheria is the only extant marsupial order with fossils in Antarctica, and the reason for this seems to be twofold. Antarctica is very underexplored, but the poor fossil record of Antarctica may also simply reflect that the species diversity of the continent was just low. One hypothesis proposes that marsupials had low diversity as they spread across Antarctica and into Australia, but underwent a dramatic radiation as Australia drifted into higher latitudes. It was that radiation which resulted in the marsupials people tend to be more familiar with. There are four orders of Australian marsupials, Diprotodontia, Daisyeromorphia, Paramelomorphia, and Notorictomorphia. Diprotodontia is easily the largest of the orders, containing kangaroos, wallabies, koalas, wombats, the gigantic diprotodon, and the predatory thylacoleo. Their collective name refers to their diagnostic two front teeth, which are large lower incisors. They also have three pairs of upper incisors and no lower canines. The second and third digits on the feet are also fused up to the claw with the fourth digit enlarged and the fifth digit usually absent. Members of this order are almost entirely herbivorous except for a few small insectivores and the bizarre fungivorous potaroos. A major exception to this is the lineage that led to Thylacoleo, the aptly named marsupial lion. Relatives of this lion-sized predator include the opossum-sized microleo and the cat-sized wakaleo, both from the Miocene. Of course, as we've discussed before, evolution can't just go back to the drawing board as an intelligent designer would. Instead, these carnivores were crafted from herbivorous ancestors, which is why their teeth are derived from those of herbivores. The next order is Daisyeromorphia. Most extant marsupial carnivores are contained in this clade, such as the thylacine, Tasmanian devil, numbat, the fat-tailed dunnart, and yellow-footed antichinus. We'll return to the thylacine shortly, but of interest here is the yellow-footed antichinus. This marsupial has such frenzied mating sessions that all the adult males actually die immediately after. Adult females die after the weaning period. We met the Dunart previously in the Howler Monkey's tail, being one of the few marsupials with trichromatic vision. And lastly, when the thylacine became extinct in 1930, the Tasmanian Devil became the largest marsupial carnivore, being about the size of a small dog. Third, Paramelomorphia contains the bandicoots and bilbies, which can be found in Australia and New Guinea. These are mostly small omnivores who have long been the subject of taxonomic controversy. For one thing, their teeth are most similar to those of Daisyeromorphia, but they also possess second and third fused toes, like Diprotodontia. It wasn't until genetic analyses came along that researchers were able to unite Daisyeromorphia with Paramelomorphia, showing that the toe configuration is an example of convergent evolution. 
The last order is Notorictomorphia, which contains the two species of marsupial moles, the animals for whom this tale exists. Marsupial moles have similar morphology and ecology to the different mole-like animals we have already met. The eyes and ears are extremely reduced, the mouth is reduced, and the claws are enlarged to move earth. We met the true moles, family Talpidae, with these characteristics in the hippo's tail, and the golden moles, family Chrysochloridae, and stem pangolin family, Epoicotheriidae, in the sloth's tail. All these clades have evolved similar characteristics to deal with similar environmental pressures, living almost entirely underground and foraging for invertebrates. The first fossil marsupial mole was unveiled in 2010, named Nerobarictes. And even though modern marsupial moles swim through sand, this early Miocene mole did not. Nerobarictes was discovered in a tropical rainforest deposit along with lyrebirds, log runners, musky rat kangaroos, striped possums, and phalangers. This means marsupial moles transition to desert environments later. Another interesting point about Nerobarictes is that it wasn't as adapted for subterranean life as the modern marsupial mole. Indeed, the paper remarks, quote, The hypertrophied olecranon process of the ulna, which enables powerful extension of the forelimb during digging, while decidedly hypertrophied and notorictid like in infilcriceri, and hence a synapomorphy for this family, is not quite as large nor as strongly curved medially as it is in species of notorictes, close quote. The teeth of Nerobarictes are also not nearly as derived as the modern marsupial moles. But the modern marsupial mole isn't the only marsupial that has convergently evolved morphology similar to placental mammals. As we mentioned in the seal's tail, the thylacine skull is extremely similar to that of dogs, so much so that it may even be confused for one. The sugar glider and flying phalangers are capable of gliding from tree to tree with their flaps of skin similar to flying squirrels. Numbats are insectivores that maintain a similar ecological niche to anteaters, and the quoll has been compared to cats. Extinct marsupials are also known to have convergently evolved with placental mammals. For example, the Australian Pelarchestes had nasal bones indicative of either a short trunk, like a taper, or well-developed prehensile lips like a rhinoceros. What is the reason for so much convergence? As we have discussed before, when niches are available, organisms will often invade those niches to avoid competition with other organisms. This is called niche partitioning. Imagine if you have two species of deer who migrate into the same forest and both species are equally adept at processing the same plants. Further, imagine that this forest has a limited number of resources such that it can't support two species with the same niche. As a result, one species is going to adapt to be better than the other at processing plants driving the other species to extinction. However, both species could coexist if they came to feed on different plant materials. For example, species A could adapt to browsing on low tree branches, while species B could adapt to grazing. If, say, the terrestrial insectivore niche is already filled, then one could adapt to feeding on subterranean insects to avoid competition. And since digging requires the same morphological adaptations, whether it's occurring in Australia, Africa, or North America, the result is that similar organisms are going to evolve on totally separate continents. And that's the marsupial mole's tail. Marsupials and placental mammals have evolved to fill similar niches independently of each other many times. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.